In this video, I'm going to talk about the first secret to avoiding a relapse, which is avoiding triggering situations. So I'm going to dig into avoiding triggering situations. So what, why, how? So avoiding triggering situations, that's the first secret to avoiding a relapse. And it's imperative to avoid triggering situations if you want to avoid a relapse, especially in your first year, especially in your first 30 days, and even especially in your first 24 hours. So the closer you are to your sobriety date, the more important it is to avoid triggering situations because you don't have the tools to work through the triggering situations yet. So, so I'm going to talk to you about how you can avoid triggering situations in this, in this video, essentially how it works for you. So lean in, listen carefully, because this episode could have a significant impact on how you can make it to a year and much closer to living a kick-ass sober life. So avoiding triggering situations, and this can include your environment, stress, negative emotions, and celebrations. So go in, environment. And so the environment that you're in, and especially you were, we're all programmed to live life a certain way. 95% of, of your thoughts, 95% of my thoughts are subconscious. So we're programmed. Only 5% of our thinking is conscious. So regardless of how badly you want to stay clean and sober, when you're in a triggering situation, your subconscious mind takes over, which here's an interesting fact. Humans are the only people that, that consciously think and uh, animals like your dog, for example, is, is a hundred, hundred percent of your dog's thinking is subconscious. And, and if you think about it, it makes sense. That means a hundred percent of his energy or her energy is focused on doing whatever it is that he's doing. So that's why animals and dogs and, and cats and fish and reptiles and birds, they're not able to figure out how to do things because we have conscious minds because we consciously think we're able to figure things out. So environment. So the environment you were, you were, you're in is going to remind you of how you're supposed to act or what you're supposed to do. And I can remember like for me, everything that I did prior to getting clean and sober, like my, all of my activities, everything revolved around drinking, drinking and doing drugs and having a good, well, what I thought was having a good time anyways. That's what I equated to having a good time was okay. And, how am I going to get loaded? And I can remember I went and played golf once and I've got lots of stories like this, but I can just remember this specifically. I was going to play golf at Kierland golf club up in North Scottsdale. And I brought, it was either an 18 pack or a 24 pack in my golf bag, which anybody that golfs knows that you're really not allowed to bring golf or beer with you on the golf course. And Sorry, that's my dog and he's eating my, that's not good. Okay, so back to the video. I, I could hear him chewing on something, so I needed to stop him. Wayne, be good. Okay, so so I, I, I brought, it was either an 18 pack or a 24 pack and I brought it to the golf course and I remember the golf cart guy, he picked up my bag and he was like, dude, what's in your golf bag? It's so heavy. And I was like, oh, I just have a bunch of golf balls in there, which I mean, again, I'm totally full of shit, which anybody who's an alcoholic, what does Dr. Drew, Dr. Drew says, alcoholics don't have the capacity to be hundred percent honest. If somebody's being hundred percent honest with me, they're probably not an alcoholic essentially is what he says. So anyways, I'm full of it. I tell him that I have a bunch of golf balls in my bag. And he said, do you mind if I check? I was like, sure, no problem. And I'm like, oh shit. And he opens it up. And of course there's like my 18 pack or my 24 pack. And he's like, and I was like, oh, I don't know how those got in there. And so he confiscates my beers and he says, you can come and get them after the round of golf. So I said, okay, great. Luckily I wasn't kicked off of the golf course and we played our round of golf and I got my beers after, after the round. I remember a time when I was at Candlestick Park, which I don't think Candlestick Park in San Francisco is open anymore, but we were, we were, we were there to watch a baseball game, the San Francisco Giants. 
and I had I had beers stashed in my stashed in my socks, like in my socks and in my pants. This was a long time ago. Uh, and I remember going into the can candlestick park and drinking the beers in the in the stands, and I got caught and I got kicked out of the game. And that was just once. I mean, I, I've got I've gotten kicked out of so many venues and events. I mean, I can remember being at a Pennywise comfort concert at the Fillmore in San Francisco and again getting kicked out because I was underage. I was using this ID that said I was way old and it was just not even true. So so the environment the environment you're in, those are all the environments that that brought me back to my drinking and drug use. So for me, the very beginning, my first year, I avoided I avoided certain situations that might potentially trigger me. I mean, whatever you can do to avoid triggering situations. And so environment is just really important. I also, I can recall dating. I mean, they say don't date for your first year while you're in recovery. And the reality is that in your first year, I know for me, my first year, I mean, I've like, we're broken as alcoholics and drug addicts in the disease the closer you are to your date of sobriety, especially your original date of sobriety, the more broken you are. And as you do work, you do the inner work, you do the steps, you do all of the things that are suggested, the more work you do, you, you start to transform and you start to become a different person. And so at the very beginning, you're broken, your picker's broken, People say, oh, my picker's broken. I've heard them say that before when it comes to dating. It's like, well, you know, <laughs> really, that's what you attract. You attract what you are. Your picker's not broken. You're broken. And that's the reality is that if you're super new, it likely you're not healthy. Like you're not. You're just emotionally, spiritually, mentally Physically, like you're not a healthy person. You're broken. And so you're going to attract somebody. I mean, once you think about where you're going to be at a year from today, if you take all the suggestions, you do the work, you work through the steps, you, you go to therapy, you go to IOP, you go to treatment, you pray, you meditate, you do a gratitude list every day. Think about the person you're going to be in a year from today. You do all that work. You're going to transform into a different person. You're going to start attracting a different person type of person you're going to attract different people into your life different people are going to want to be around you so drinking holidays so there's i mean what those are types of situations like for me the the football games the tailgating the concerts holidays like those are the types of things that were were triggering for me so i kind of my first year i kind of really plugged myself into recovery and hanging out with people from the rooms of the 12 step program, hanging out with people that were, you know, doing yoga, getting involved in that community, getting involved in communities that were more revolved around health and wellness. So it doesn't always have to be the 12 step program. I talk a lot about the 12 step program because that was what worked for me, Alcoholics Anonymous. That was what worked for me. That was where I built my foundation. But there were a lot of other things that I did. And I would, and I would also say that people that are just focused on AA or just focused on the 12 step program, I don't think that that's health. I mean, I don't think that that's, that that's not, that's not going to be long-term in my opinion. Anyways, there are, might be other people that have different opinions, but I just think that's one piece of the puzzle. I think there's lots of other pieces and they, they say that people that have more communities. So more communities is associated with happiness. So I've got my 12 step community, but then I've also, I also have all these other different communities that I'm plugged into. I'm training for rim to rim to rim, the Grand Canyon. So there's a different community of people, some in recovery, some not in recovery that are going to be doing rim to rim to rim. I'm, I'm a cyclist. I go to F45. I do yoga. I'm actually about to go to my yoga teacher training. So I'm going to become a certified yoga instructor, which I've wanted to do for a long time. And it's something I would say that that's kind of like a passion project for me. And I'm really like yoga, the, the principles of yoga are aligned with the principles of AA. So I'm really excited. And actually, this is my second round 
of doing it. I, or I started doing yoga teacher training earlier this year and I ended up having to bail out because I just couldn't, I had too much on my plate. I wasn't able to finish it. So it's like, Hey, you know, I, I know what I can handle. I got, I ended up getting sick and it just was too much stress for me. I mean, I've been sober for a while, so something like that's not going to take me out, but it did. I, I did realize I do have the awareness. That's the, another thing that I've gained by being clean and sober, working the 12 steps, doing lots of therapy and lots of things to really focus on my, my well being and my health and my fitness and my spiritual fitness and my mental fitness and my emotional fitness, all those things help create awareness so that I know like, Hey, this is a decision I need to make. And when I started yoga teacher training the first time, I kind of knew it was going to be a lot for me. And I started anyways, which, Hey, it's, it's fine. And then I, I just ended up having to, I ended up having to bail out. So let's see here. Stress, that is also something that can cause a relapse or lead to a relapse. So avoiding, avoiding times or things that cause stress whenever possible. I mean, Hey, when I was, when I first got clean and sober, let's see, I don't know about my first year. Okay. Yeah. I was separated in my first year. I was divorced. It was after my first year when I was finally officially divorced. So these are the things that happened to me. These are the stressful situations, right? Separation, divorce, bankruptcy. I short sold four of five homes that I owned. So I lost four homes. My real estate license was revoked. I, let's see here. What else? There were, I mean, those, those are some of the big things. And I stayed sober through all of those things and that's stress. However, I, I put in the work and you know, there's another thing that there's a guy named Bo Easton. He talks about being an amateur versus being a professional and amateurs don't practice. Amateurs don't follow through amateurs make excuses. And I see most people that get clean and sober relapse within their first year. And quite honestly, those are, they're amateurs. They're amateurs because they're not following through with what they were supposed to do. It's, this is AA, the 12 steps. It's a very simple program. It's not difficult. It's not complex. It's very easy. Go to a meeting every day, call your sponsor and your sponsor is going to give you instructions. Call your sponsor every single day, do a gratitude list. I mean, those aren't all parts of the, of the 12 step program, but the, some of these are just things that, that I were told to me. These were suggestions. Go to a meeting every day, call your sponsor every day. Call three people in, in recovery every single day. Do a gratitude list every single day. Get, pick up a service commitment. Get a home group. Home group, service commitment. Do Work through the steps. Work through all 12 steps. And what I hear from people, I hear excuses. I've sponsored lots of people. And I can't even tell you. I hear, you know, it's like, hey, call me every single day. And I get these lame excuses from, from people. And it's like, oh, I was so busy. I didn't have 60 seconds to call you. And it's like, well, no, I mean, and remember your best thinking got you where you are today. So your best thinking is not going to get you to long-term recovery because your best thinking got you where you are today. And so my suggestion is to take suggestions, A. Okay, that's number one. Number two, follow through with the suggestions. Don't come up with excuses. Amateurs come up with excuses. Amateurs fail. Be a professional when it comes to AA. Be a professional. And, and I know when I, I did Ironman a couple of times and people used to say that I trained like I was a pro. And so I wasn't professional by, by any means, but, I, but I, I, I followed through. I had a coach, my coach wrote my workouts for me. I followed through with the training as it was prescribed. Therefore, when game time came, like, I, I mean, I was solid. My, my time was fast. It wasn't whether or not I was going to finish. And I mean, I hear people, I actually had a, a, a couple of people that I know they did a half Ironman recently and they both DNF'd, which means did not finish. And they didn't do the work. They didn't do the work. That's why they didn't finish. And if you want to be clean and sober, do the work. It's not hard. It's really not.
and it might seem like a, a not that big of a deal to pick up the phone and call your sponsor every day, but pick up the phone and call your sponsor every day. If your sponsor wants you to call him every day, pick up the phone and call him every day. He might not answer. Leave a message. I know for me, I'm super busy. And a lot of times when a sponsee calls me, I don't answer the phone. It's like, it doesn't matter. It's the point of making the phone call. Be humble. Humble yourself. Your sponsor doesn't, he might be busy. He might not be busy. Who knows? Doesn't really matter. Pick up the phone and call him because it's important. You'll do whatever it is is important to you. If you think it's important. So that's the thing is like, you got to think it's important. If you want to be clean and sober, just take the simple steps. Call your sponsor, go to a meeting, do the step work, journal, pray, meditate, hit your knees, like whatever you, you think you need to do to be on the path. If you want to be clean and sober, just do the things that are recommended. Do the things that I talk about in my videos. Okay, stress, conflict. You want to avoid stress and conflict whenever, whenever possible. But, you know, the thing is that if you're spiritually fit, if you're practicing like a professional, and that means you're making mistakes, that means you're, but you're grinding it out, you're taking steps to become a professional, a professional in recovery. I know that sounds kind of weird. I, I don't know if I've ever talked about it like this before. And, and the reason why I'm talking about it is because a few nights ago, we went and played cash flow with Robert Kiyosaki, you know, rich, rich dad, poor dad, Robert Kiyosaki. And he talked a lot about an amateur versus a professional. And you think about Tiger Woods. And it's not like he, Tiger Woods is just naturally gifted. I mean, yeah, he might be a good athlete, but he works his ass off. He practices his ass off. And that's why he became so great. There's a guy named Bo Eason who he also tells, he, he runs an event called the Personal Storytelling Power Event. I went and, and I've heard him talk about Jerry Rice. So Bo Eason played in the NFL. He has a Super Bowl ring. And he talked about how he, you know, he went to this high school with, he had 27 people on his football team. And Let's see, the percentage is point, like 0.003% of, of high school football players are going to make it to the NFL. He had 27 people on his football team. Nobody from his football team or from his school had ever made it to the NFL prior to him. Both him and his brother and two other guys on their team made it to the NFL. Nobody else after them had made it to the NFL. So the four guys, one team, they all made it to the NFL. And what he attributes that to is the work ethic and they practiced and all of their decisions supported his dream. His dream was to be in the NFL. So maybe it's not your dream to, to be a person in long-term recovery, but I'll tell you what, life is pretty damn good being in long-term recovery or being in long-term sobriety and living an amazing life and living your best life. His dream was to be in the NFL. Therefore, all of his decisions supported that decision. All of his decisions. So he didn't even have to make any decisions. Okay, does this decision support my dream to go to the NFL? If it does, then yeah, then the answer is yes. He even didn't go to the prom. He didn't go to the prom because that he, you know, that meant he was potentially going to go out and he was going to party and maybe drink and and that wasn't going to help support his dream of going to the NFL. He didn't even date. He didn't even date. Now, his dream was to make it to the NFL. And most people watching this video, your, your goal is to be clean of drugs and alcohol. And life is amazing if you're clean and sober and your life is free from alcohol and you can be in triggers don't bother you. It's going to take you some time. It's going to take you some work. You got to put in the work. That's the thing. You got to put in the work. If you put in the work, then it's going to be easy. Like it's going to happen. Okay. Going back to Bo Eason. Bo Eason talks about Jerry Rice. So Bo Eason says he used to always be the first person on the practice field and the last person to leave. And he said when he went to go play for the Niners, he, got, he ended up being traded. He started with the, the Houston Oilers, and then he went over to play with the Niners. And he said that he shows up to the Niners, and he shows up, and he's there He's there super early. And he goes out to the field because he's going to be the first person on the practice field. And 
he said that Jerry Rice was already there. He's like, what the, what the hell? And, and that just goes to show Jerry Rice had the work ethic. He was a professional. He trained like a professional. He was a great player. But guess what? He was a great player, not because he was talented. He was a great player because he was talented. And he worked harder than everybody else. He was the first one on the field, and he was the last one to leave. If you want to be clean and sober and you want to get plugged in, be the first one at the meeting, help get that room set up, do service work, and stay after the meeting and socialize and connect with other people that are in the rooms and be of service and help a newcomer. Like that's how you're going to get yourself plugged in. That's how, that's how you do it. Okay. Stress, conflict, negative emotions can also be triggering. So drugs, remember drugs and alcohol is the solution. And Dr. Gabor Mate says, the question is not why the addiction, the question is why the pain. So there's, and I did a video on, on negative emotions on my YouTube channel, negative emotions. And, and so this too shall pass whatever negative emotion you're feeling will pass. You just pray, meditate, call your sponsor, go to a meeting, call another friend that's in recovery, go exercise, go work out, sing a song, do something that makes you happy. Go hug your, play with your dog. I mean, like do something to make you feel better. Don't pick up a drink. Don't pick up a drug. Just this too shall pass. But the negative emotions, and that speaks to hanging out with people that put out negative emotions, people that you're the average of the five people that you spend the most time with. So spend your time with people that have what you want, people that are positive, people that lift you up, people that help you live the new life that you want. I mean, you're in the process of changing your life. And that means new lifestyle habits, new healthy lifestyle habits. And so your old lifestyle habits got you where you are today. Whatever your lifestyle habits were, like for me, I know my lifestyle habits were get loaded, figure out, you know, go to a concert, get loaded, go to a football game, get loaded, go out to a pool house, get loaded. Go out in Old Town Scottsdale, get loaded. I mean, like whatever it was, there was always, okay, there may have been other activities, but the real intention was to get loaded. And so focusing on new lifestyle habits is going to be the key to changing the way that you live and changing the way that you respond. So, and, and like in your, in my first year, in your first year, I, I would say hang out with people in recovery, do recovery related activities because those people are going to help you make the right decision. If you hang out with people that are, that are drinking and drugging, even socially that like that, it's going to be much easier to go back to doing that. Especially if you're hanging out with people that are still in the disease, you got no chance. <clears throat> so, so there's a couple of things I can talk about dating. So like for me, my relationships have continued getting better. And the first woman that I dated after I got clean and sober, it was a year and a half after I got, I didn't date for my first year. And then like a year and a half in, I got into my first relationship, my first sober relationship. And it was the, the healthiest relationship I'd ever been in. However, that was, it was still, <laughs> so that woman, she, she, she wasn't necessarily, I don't think she was an alcoholic, but she liked to drink. She liked to drink probably more than was more than I cared for. And she liked to do some other things. She liked to smoke weed a little bit. So she liked to smoke a little weed. She liked to drink a little bit. I was sober. And, and then I remember there were a couple of times when she got pretty shit faced, which I mean, Hey, like I don't judge it's all good, but I don't know, maybe it wasn't the best for me. I felt really uncomfortable with it. I mean, I was still like a year and a half sober. Then the, so that was, that was my first relationship and it was, you know, it was the healthiest relationship I'd ever been in. And then the next relationship I was in was healthier. The next, and at five years, I got into a relationship with a woman and that was the, the, the healthiest relationship I'd ever been in. And I remember being five years sober, getting into this new relationship and going, ah, man, okay. Like I'm doing pretty good. I'm doing pretty good because the relationship's healthy. She was healthy. And that's what I attracted. And I was like, okay, this is pretty awesome. So, and then now I'm, I'm in another relationship 
and it's like it's it's even healthier. It's like the best. every re- every subsequent relationship, as long as I continue doing the work, I continue transforming, I continue becoming a different person, and I attract different women into my life. I jer- attract different friends into my life. So just my whole world, I attract different people, different women, different men, different people, different friends, different business associates. I attract different people, and I just I just love it. I love who I attract today. I love it. I love my life. I love the things I get to do. I love the people that call me on the phone. I love the people that text me. I love creating value. I love making a contribution to this world because I've learned that being in recovery, it's all about making a contribution. I get fulfillment by giving it away, the 12th step, helping other people. And whether it's teaching them the principles of AA, sponsoring a person, or just showing somebody how to do something that's not even recovery related, whether it's a, you know, yoga, I'm going to be a yoga, a a certified yoga teacher, yoga certified yoga teacher. I mean, that's not AA, but guess what? I get to teach people. I get to show people. I'm really looking forward to that. Breath work. I show people how to do breath work all the time. I love breath work. Red light therapy. I mean, like all the things that I do, my morning routine, my morning routine is amazing. I love my morning routine. I, I can't tell you how many people I've taught my morning routine to who, who follow through with it. And most don't follow through with it, but I share it with a lot of people. And so going back to, to meetings, it's like finding the right meetings is, is so important. Fi- or actually, no, finding people that you have fun around. So finding your crew, finding your tribe, having fun, laughing, like all the things I do, I have fun. I don't take things too seriously. Life is good. And I'm just, I'm just so, so grateful. Actually, I went to a meeting last night. It's called Hogan's Heroes. It's in Paradise Valley and it's 5 PM on Sunday. And I've been going to that meeting for almost 11 years. And I went back and there was a woman that got a 10 year chip. And I remember her from the first couple of years I was sober. There was another guy who got a 30 day chip. And I remember about three or four years ago, he was also trying to get clean and sober. And I remember him telling me at that time, he said, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't think I'm ready, man. I don't think I'm ready. And he was, he was honest. <laughs> he, he said, I don't think I'm ready to be clean and sober. And he wasn't. And now he is now. It's like the disease is progressive. Luckily, doesn't I, I haven't spoken with, I haven't had like a deep conversation with him. I'm going to get together with him on Wednesday in a couple of days. But he seems like he's doing good. And luckily, it, I don't think he lost everything. I mean, he actually looks pretty good too. So, so I'll, I'll, I'll find, find out more. Okay, so that's it for this episode. Quick review, the insights you and I both rediscovered in this video. We talked about what? We talked about triggering situations being the first secret to avoiding a relapse along with why triggering situations is it, avoiding triggering situations is imperative if you want to avoid a relapse. So, and we also talked about how to avoid triggering situations. So remember these insights will only work for you if you work them. So please make sure you apply what you've learned in this video, because if you do, you'll be on your way to living a kick-ass sober life. And I think you'll agree. That's exciting to think about. And speaking of reviews, before we end this video, I want you to type in your biggest takeaway or aha moment you experienced during this episode in the comment section or in this video. So go ahead and declare your one big takeaway in the comment section. It'll take just 60 seconds out of your day, but what you declare could provide you a lifetime of happiness and freedom. Okay, that does it for this video. I'm Tim Westbrook, and I hope that our paths cross again in the next video. If you found this video to be of value, be sure to like it, subscribe to our channel if you want to see more videos, leave a comment if you have a question or if you've got something to say. Camelback Recovery provides treatment services for people struggling with mental health, mental illness, addiction, alcoholism. So if you or someone you know is struggling, be sure to reach out to us. You can go to our website, camelbackrecovery.com or our information is in the comment section below and we provide everything from detox, inpatient, outpatient treatment, sober living, recovery coaching, sober companion services. So either we'll be able to help you or we'll be able to refer you to people or treatment centers that might be a better fit. So I will see you in the next video.